All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Your Folk Radio. This is the Restoration Hour, where we try to restore our heritage as a white Christian civilization and uh, the U.S. Constitution. Today, we're going to be talking, uh, first of all, feudalism, and then the uh, the transition from feudalism to uh, how should I put it? The uh, well, actually, Bolshevism. So we'll we'll make a transition from feudalism to uh, to Kazaria during our interview. So how are you doing, uh, Matt Johnson? Oh, I'm doing it. You know, out here, I don't know how it is where you are, but in Pittsburgh, it's like seventy degrees today. Okay. Now, what the hell's going on in this world? You know, <laughs> right. it was twenty degrees. It was twenty degrees a few days ago. Yeah. You know, you know, weather-wise, there's like one weekend in November. I'm happy, and that's yeah. pretty much about. It. Yeah. Well, uh, twenty degrees is coming right up on you, man, because <laughs> that's how cold it is here in Chicago, and it almost started snowing today. So our weather precedes your weather by about a day. Right. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. It's the same same stream. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's what's coming up for you tomorrow. So you just deal with it. <laughs> deal with it, bro. Right. I, I live in Alaska any day of the week. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's times where Alaska is warmer than Chicago, so <laughs> they're not complaining. Well, All right. It's also, as you say, it's also very white and very civilized. Two things that I'm a big fan of. Yeah. Very good. Very good. All right. So. Uh, uh, I stumbled upon your book, The Third Rome, which de- deals with feudalism. It's primarily Russian feudalism, uh, but I thought we would introduce the subject in a more general way. There's a, a website called Antonius Aquinas, which uh, I thought was very good because I, I get sick and tired of he- hearing left-wing slash liberal skeptics and complainers about white civilization uh, dumping on feudalism, which uh, after I've, I had studied it after a while, I, I determined was not so bad. But it's pretty much like anything else, uh, even uh, slavery in the South. You could have a very kind and gentle uh, slave master, or you could have a very wicked one, <laughs> right? And so th- that's how I perceive uh, both Russian feudalism and French f- feudalism until they got to the point where they started to get it, becoming degenerate, although the Russian feudalism did not become very degenerate in my view. Maybe you can correct me on that score. And, the, uh, and this website says, one of the biggest misconceptions held among the independent and alternative media is that of feudalism and the political, economic, and social arrangements which characterize that unfairly maligned epoch. Derogatory language is often used to describe feudal times with commentators often suggesting that today's political and financial elites seek to return mankind to such supposedly depressed, stagnant, and repressive condition. Well, that second sentence is true, but it's not just the uh, social elites, it's also the Bolsheviks who are trying to bring back feudalism as disguised as communism. So, what uh, you know? What would your general characterization of feudalism be? Because I, I think this is a fairly reasonable comment here. Well, you know, this you know, the Middle Ages have been a, a huge area of mine for uh, 25 years now. Okay. Um, both East and West, which mean, meaning Eastern and Western Europe, two very very different civilizations. I'm uncomfortable using the word feudalism to cover them both. Okay. Because a good definition of feudalism is what happens when central authority breaks down mm-hmm. and political power gets decentralized. Uh, it's not even political anymore. It becomes privatized. Okay. And um, smaller landowners join up with bigger ones for the sake of mutual protection. The great advantage of, of this in, in the West, we're really talking about the Carolingian era. Okay. Uh, you know, that, that's really, and that's it. Because once power is restored in a central um, government, feudalism is, is less and less relevant, but um, uh, you had this cross-section of authorities. So at any given moment, you had you know, a monastery, you had a parish, you had a bishop, a very powerful, you had a, cer- a city or urban people, you had your, your landlord, you had um, the monarch, who often was irrelevant, but you know, still occasionally can, can be powerful. All of these authorities uh, crisscrossing all the time. Mm-hmm. So it was a tremendous check and balance system. Okay, so was this by design or just worked out that way? 
checks well, and balances. Well, it's just what they really, it, it, this is what happens. This is what human beings do. Okay. You know, central authority breaks down. You had a relatively, you know, um, you know, half barbarian, half Roman population, not, not bad stock to work with. And um, you had memories of old Rome still in, 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 you know, central France. And um, yeah, it, you know, it's really just how it worked out. But, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it, it, there's a certain sense to it. Now, there was no such thing as a central authority. There's no such thing as, as a, as a, an all power, even, even when monarchy was restored, even under, under Charlemagne, mm-hmm. um, you know, he didn't have a day-to-day uh, authority over, over a peasant commune. He dealt with, you know, general issues of taxation, which came from r- nobles and military policy. Otherwise that was it. Yeah. There was no capital city. The capital city went where he went. So uh, there, there was no bureaucracy of any kind whatsoever. Yeah, okay. so. so there, there wasn't, if I'm, I'm reading you correctly, there's no overbearing centralized government that uh, hovering over the people's lives like we have today. That would be a great place to start to define mm-hmm. feudalism because okay. feudalism centers around the decentralization, forced the, the, the cent- you know, dispersion of political authority okay. uh, in the hands of uh, different authority. I, I like the word authority over power because – Power is just, you know, coercion. Authority is the right to use coercion. So you had authorities more than power. Okay. Uh, you, take, you take one peasant anywhere, and like I say, you, you had five or six authorities over him that could play off against each other. And um, don't, don't count that out as far as a checks and balance origin, because it just I made see. a lot of sense. Right. Okay. All right. Well, here, uh, let me just uh, quote one more uh, item here from this article, which I think speaks to what you just said. Germany remained for the longest time an area of decentralized political authority, (laughs) the word, two words you just used, as Professor Stevenson explains, quote, from the Rhineland to the Slavic frontier, armies were made up of knights. Society was dominated by a chivalrous aristocracy. The countryside was dotted with Mott and Bailey castles, and governments were organized on the basis of feudal tenure. If the Lord needed military service or financial aid beyond what was specifically owed by his vassals, his only recourse was to ask them for a voluntary grant. He had no right to tax or assess them arbitrarily, for his authority in such matters was determined by feudal contract. Huh. That's interesting, because the impression I have always gotten from critics of feudalism was this was an overbearing, centralized dictatorship. Uh, well, uh, give the person my number, because he's illiterate. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, yeah. um, feudalism, another, another way, I always thought in the Russian sense, and in the Byzantine sense, is the Byzantines never had feudalism. But it's, they use it in a way, it's the guarantee of land to peasant families. Okay. Um, okay. That, that's a more Russian definition of the term. That's where it came from. Um, okay. the, the peasant was connected to the land. You couldn't move the peasant without the land. He was guaranteed to have it. Uh-huh. And during the um, time of troubles in Russia, um, early 17th century, um, as always what happens when things break down, bigger landlords get bigger because you're going to them for protection. Well, after Boris Kudin, or even under Boris Kudin, they made sure that this was impossible um, because big landlords were – uh, taking away labor from smaller ones, and this was not a good thing. Uh-huh. And uh, because they were always the monarch is always at war with nobles. They they despise each other. They're two two totally different things. Okay, if you've read Master Rome, that's uh, the whole concept. Okay, so, quick question: How did the bigger landlords take labor away from the smaller ones? Because they had more resources, they could offer better deals. Ah, uh, okay. They so, offer this very this is very contract oriented. This is very law oriented. Uh-huh. But when I say law, I mean custom. Right, which was certainly more important. You know, written laws were when you read these written law codes from back then, it's really boring reading because they're yeah. so general. Yeah, they generally deal with no. It, it, the day to day was done by the communal arrangements, largely uh, relig- religiously based. You know, um, that's really where the the authority came from. Yes. So, because they had more money, they had more people, they could offer better terms. Yeah, and so they were destroying, taking labor away from. Smaller landlords, and that's really where Russian feudalism comes from. Uh huh. Okay, so the feudalistic system was that like a check against the uh, greater power of the larger feudal lords? Is that how the feudalism that, emerged? That's, great, that's a great way of putting it. Okay. Um, that was when Peter the Great um, 
returned from Europe, whether or not it was the same man, you know, I did a whole broadcast. I don't think it was the same man who came back bringing all these foreigners, uh, high ranking Freemasons back to Russia. Everything changed. Mm -hmm. And, um, the 18th century saw the introduction of the worst forms of centralized government with the worst forms of feudalism. Mm. And thank the 19th century that was put right. Um, and then Russia ended up having the best of both. Right. But in the 18th century in Russia was a very, very dark time, a revolutionary time. Um, and, you know, you had you know, essentially foreigners running the country. Um, really? And, foreigners? How'd they get, get in, uh, involved? Well, coming from Peter, um, he, oh, it, it really is so short. I mean, Catherine the Great didn't speak Russian very well. Oh, right. <laughs> Neither did Lenin. <laughs> uh, right, right. The two Annas didn't speak Russian very well. They were about as orthodox as, as my cats are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Freemasonry was everywhere. Foreigners were brought in. Peter the Great was a demonist. Um, oh, wow. He wrote odes, which I've read. He wrote odes to Dionysius. Um, and he would he would march through Petersburg, which was the Gnostic floating city he named after himself, uh, blaspheming drunken, all his drunken people, an army of people, uh, singing these these songs that he wrote. Some of them still survive huh. to Dionysus and, and the, the main eyes and everything else. Sometimes he'd be naked. Yeah, he was off his nut. Right. But militar militarily, he did well. And it really doesn't matter what you do. If you win wars, you're going to stay in power. Right. But uh, the Petrian state was a complete perversion. He he covered it with, with the old Roman gods and everything else. Um, uh, it really right. was a pagan Gnostic symbol and quite literally built on the bones of the Cossacks, which is a symbol for him because they were used as forced labor mm. to build this. And so it was literally built on top of their bones in the wow. most ridiculous, inhospitable part of the world. Um which was an old Gnostic trick to be able to dominate nature and bringing all these Masons in from Great Britain. He completely revolutionized at least the, the city. I mean, Russian tradition was banned in St. Petersburg. You couldn't wear beards. Russian dress was, was forbidden. Um, it was meant to be a foreign city. That's why he left Moscow. So he was a liberal. So the, Peter, Peter the Great was a liberal is what you're saying. Culturally speaking. Yes. Culturally speaking, he was secular. Uh -huh. He, uh, he was uh, yeah, sexually liberated. Let's put it that way. Interesting. And, um, Interesting. As was Catherine the Great. Well, let me put it like this. His his first wife was a very holy, very good woman, Eudoxia. Okay. When this person came back from Northern Europe, his, his so-called great embassy, um, he shut her away in a monastery. Wow. She was convinced that it wasn't him because he didn't even recognize her. Hmm. So then um, he took, on one of his campaigns in Northern Europe, he had took a surf girl named Marta who his officers have passed around for a few days, already an alcoholic. She was, I guess she was good looking. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And as a way to mock the throne, he made her Empress Catherine the first. Oh, wow. She was illiterate. She didn't know where she was most of the time. The nobles of course ran the country and she died of cirrhosis of the liver after a short time. So that, that's, that's the kind of, I want to say right. liberal. Yeah. This is the kind of crap we're talking about. French revolutionaries put the whore of Babylon on the throne of the Bishop of Paris. Oh yeah. That's what he, that was his way of spitting at, at Russian yeah, tradition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Peter himself then uh, sounds like what you're saying is he was a degenerate in a yes. very very conservative era. And uh, uh, to what extent did the boyars or the other nobles follow his example? Was this did this become common, like in the French court, or no? He created his own nobility, mostly foreign. So, um, the Petersburg world. He created an entirely new bureaucracy. He uh, a new set, set of ranks. He wanted to eliminate the old Muscovite nobility. Yeah, I see. And the rebellion, there were numerous rebellions, some of them huge. But the old believers, which I have a book on the old believers, which are the traditionalist Orthodox, numbered about 30 million at the time. Wow. Uh, okay. The official Orthodox Church, they were good people. But they were, he purged the church no different than Lenin did. No different. He just didn't have the, I mean, he, he, I mean, he tortured and murdered his own son, which is another um, bit of uh, evidence that it really wasn't him. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, he 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 was a you know was a rocker. Um, <laughs> Peter the yeah, Rocker. He, he, and oh people really thought God. thought it was people thought that he was if it, if it was him, he was possessed because he didn't sleep. Um, he walked so fast. He was almost seven feet tall, which was a freak at the time. Ooh, yeah. Uh, that's not the guy who left Russia though. The guys, the, the embassy that left Russia to visit the capitals of Western Europe, all those Russians never returned. A handful returned with a Peter that didn't look 
like the old one and was like six inches taller. Right. <laughs> his own wife. So he yeah. came back understanding to create a Masonic revolution in the country. But he didn't convince anybody except his new bureaucracy that slowly took over. Um, oh. And uh, but that was reintegrated to some extent in in the 19th century. There was some okay. uh, and his daughter, Elizabeth, was probably the only good ruler of the 18th century. But the 19th oh. century was different. Starting with Paul, um, you had you had one excellent ruler after another for all their flaws. They were excellent. Were they? So they attempted to reintegrate Peter's system with old Russia. And to a great extent, they succeeded. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, take, take us back to Ivan the Terrible. In your book, The Third Rome, uh, I'm going to be quoting here from page 55. And then maybe you could quickly tell people how they can get a copy of this book after I read the quote. As a boy, the Tsar apparently uh, was placed in what was essentially solitary confinement. The scions of the noble families of Russia would come to his room and mock him, taunting him with the power they had and were soon to acquire at the expense of his family. At the age of 13, Ivan took the throne and immediately executed one of his chief tormentors and subversives, the scion of the extremely power powerful Shusky family, Andre. Okay, so maybe you can, you know, first uh, let us know how people can get a copy of this book, which I found fascinating, and uh, maybe you can provide some more details for this quote. Back to you. Okay. Uh, it's published by the Barnes Review. Oh, okay. I, was editor of the, I was editor of the Barnes Review at the time when I wrote it, and Willis Cardo gave me generous time off to, to work on it, and I, you know, I loved the man. I, it was a shame when he died. Okay. Um, He's very good to me, but, um, and it's still for sale now. I was, um, 29 when I wrote it, you know, I was young. There's certain things I wouldn't say today. I was angry when I wrote it, as you could probably figure out. <laughs> right. Um, I wonder what the book was, was you read the third Rome and it's an outline of what the rest of my life is going to be like, intellectually speaking. And it's, it's true. I've kept to that. Okay. Uh, obviously you can't do a history of Russia, you know, in 250 pages. It's an outline. Right. It's a way to take our point of view and apply it to Russia in the most general sense. And then, of course, I spend spending the rest of my life now filling in the blanks, right. which is how I think. Uh, now, as far as that, so you can go to the Barnes Review and buy it from there. We have our credit cards back. I'm Good. the senior researcher over there. Um, you know, the, the, they went bankrupt twice. So, you know, I, I, I lost my job as editor. I went became a professor at Mount St. Mary's in, in Maryland. And... Um, uh, and of course, yeah, they they barely you know, they barely function, but they're still putting out a great publication. I'm very proud to be associated with them. They gave me my first job right out of grad school. Okay. I did nothing without this guy. So now the quote itself, um, Ivan the Fourth was was a very was a great man. Um, he was not a bloody man. He was not a not a violent man, but he came to power in a very very difficult time. He like I said before, monarchs and nobles hate each other. Mm. The more powerful the noble class becomes the more arrogant they become. I see. A monarch, the monarch is concerned with the common good. The nobles, at their worst, are concerned with keeping the property that they have and, right. and getting more. Right. Now, there's always been good noble families. I'm not, but by the time when Ivan was a kid, as that quote mentions, the big noble, noble family, Suski was, was one of them, um, uh, Turkasi, uh, there were so many of them. They had huge armies. Their armies were much bigger than the, than the Muscovite army. They had navies if they had a shoreline. Wow. They were little warriors. They had intelligence. They, they, they even sometimes even had their own money. They were very, very powerful uh, corporations. And Ivan was faced with a choice. Either I smash these people or Russia's finished. Because uh, these guys were planning on making it. Many of them in the West were planning on making a deal with Poland, becoming Roman Catholic. And because Poland was a pure oligarchy. I mean, it was the purest oligarchy you can imagine. Well, the U.S. today is, but right. it's close to the U.S. It's almost American. Is how, I mean, it was a brutal, the worst kind of serfdom you could think of. Okay. Feudalism, well, absolute yeah. worst was in Poland. So um, so that's what Ivan dealt with. And he wasn't, he wasn't entirely successful. But, you know, he didn't execute that many people. He was a very merciful man. Okay. He should have been harsher than he was. Um, but he just didn't have the resources. Uh -huh. His uh, uh, Opercina at its height, had like 2,500 guys. 
um, they, they, they make it out to be this massive, you know, secret police force. Mm. And what it was, it, it was a, it was a elite force. And in Ivan, Ivan's own sense, this was a dress rehearsal for Armageddon. And he saw it that way. Okay. And this was a very, almost a religious order. Guys who were absolutely morally without spot to be his elite guard. Right. And they're the ones who were sent against some of these uh, dominant and very quite degenerate nobles. Right. Okay. Um, in the city yeah. of Novgorod. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're jumping ahead in history a little bit. We, we will get back to Kazaria and the formation of it. Uh, but jumping in, because what you just said about Poland being a gigantic oligarchy, uh, you're talking in times where Jewish moneylenders and, and Jews pretty much ruled Poland and had right. total total control of the nobility, and not, thus it made it hell on earth for the peasants in Poland. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, so the Catholic Church, was this a facade in Poland? Look, uh, the, the, there was no, I mean, Poland is, is a figure of speech. They, they, the monarch didn't have much power. They, they were essentially, it was a, it was an interlocking set of fiefdoms, is essentially okay. what Poland was at the time. Um, nowhere else did the, the, the nobles want to destroy the monarchy more than Poland. Really? They, 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 would, they would deliberately lose wars for the sake of... Uh, uh, oh, uh, that's kind of like they today. Would <laughs> right? so what they would do is, um, you know, in England and elsewhere, a monarch often came to power by building up city merchants and then taxing them. Right. Well, Nobles said, well, this isn't going to happen. So they brought in Jews. This was a deliberate ah. plot, starting the 13th century ah, onward. Okay. And these, these Jews functioned because they were given charters of immunity by, by the great noble family. They took over the cities. By the time of, of Kimoniski's rebellion against them in 1648, 90% of the world's Jewish population lived in the Polish Empire. Right. And it got so bad before Kimoniski uh, overthrew them. And that in that year, they thought the Messiah was coming <laughs> because right? their rule their rule was so overwhelming that it's got to be. Yeah, yeah. So well, uh, no, the Catholic yeah. Church. I mean, yeah, it was a facade. It doesn't mean they weren't good Catholics. I'm not, I'm not saying that. It's just right. Um, it was a a, a Judeo oligarchic uh, state. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, but the peasants were basically practiced Catholicism. And the Catholic, yes. the Catholic, Catholic Church kind of looked the other way while the Jews manipulated the Polish peasants and the fiefdom? It's, it's, hard, it's hard to put it any other way. Okay. Um, there always were good noble clans. There were always people. Yeah, who yeah did. they're not all evil. Uh, that's what I got yeah. from your book, uh, Third Rome, yeah. is that it was pretty much a, a war between the monarchy and certain rebellious noble families who uh, you know, sometimes make leagues with outside countries, as you mentioned, Poland, and uh, make trouble for the monarch. So the monarch was not under feudalism, this overarching dictator that uh, a lot of these critics of feudalism portray him as. Right? So well, what you're... Yeah, he had very little power. Um, the, the, the authority was in the Siem or the, or the parliament that the noble families ran and controlled, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, uh, the, but the king, or in this case, the czar, well, he did have the option of creating a secondary nobility, namely the military, who would be loyal to him and not to any feudal lords. How did that work out? Well, I mentioned that was the Opportuna. Oh, that, um, oh that's that okay. His, yeah, that was his elite core. Uh, Peter almost did the, you know, the Antichrist does everything by inversion. Peter's new nobility was an inversion of, okay. of Ivan's. Um, it was I the exact see. Okay. These guys in, and under Ivan were um, – there, there's a couple of nationalist groups out there called you know, the Opportunity. They, they call themselves that. They were black. Um, they had the horses. Um, okay. They, they had, they had um, brooms that they wore on their horses that had to be black that, that were sweeping out of uh, corruption. Right. Okay. And, and so that, they, they, were, they were to go up against the standing armies of the noble class. That's how big they were. Right. In Poland – and, and so if you're a noble in Russia, you look to Poland and you say, damn, I want that. Yeah. That's the life I want. I see. And so, so okay. in that, you know, during the Renaissance in, in Europe, the Russian monarchs were desperate to make sure that that didn't happen. Mm, okay. Yeah, because in your book you say that the uh, nobles could have very hard times because they basically had to act as uh, uh, 
chief chief cook and bottle washer, dog catcher. Uh, they had to pay taxes. They had to make sure all the uh, peasants were employed and producing food for not only for their uh, fiefdom, uh, but for the country as well. Uh, this often was a very, very difficult task, much harder on the nobles than on the monarchy, right? Yeah, don't get the idea that in, in Russia, only with a handful of exceptions, the nobles were pretty much of the same class as the peasantry. Okay. Oh, there were no formal. There were no formal legal classes at the time. I see. Um, okay. These guys were military men, who the monarch had to force to serve the country, and that's where oh. they got their legitimacy from. I see. And they had a tough life. Yeah. They, they had peasants were able to get, but you know these guys were always they were they were and there was no bureaucracy. There was a handful of guys in Moscow. Mm-hmm. Policy was taken care of by these families. Uh, okay. who all had, you know, their own standing armies. Um, and, okay. and, you know, so again, you didn't really have any army that you would get in Russia was a noble muster. It wasn't until Ivan IV that created the first standing army in, in, in the okay. country uh, because right. everything else was done, you know, locally. Okay, so so, so the, the chief obstacle to Russia's existence in these days was the hordes from Asia, right? So it would be in the nobles' interest, the monarchy's interest, the uh, Russian Orthodox Church's interest for all of these nobles and their knights and their, uh, you know, the, their assistants to band together and make war against the invaders, right? That would keep the country together? Well, that's, first of all, we're going way back. Okay. The, the Mongol takeover was in the 13th century. So yeah, okay, yeah. Um, well, we want to go back to 800. Uh, so let's back. Let's backtrack. That's that's not a problem. So so go okay. ahead. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. When we talk about Western Europe, we're talking about the you know the Carolingian era. Um, we're talking about the Russian case, Ivan the Terrible. We're talking about you know the Renaissance. So okay. you know that's so it, it, it fits, but we have to make sure that we're we know what we're talking about when we say yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I don't believe that the Mongols were Asian. There's no records of them being oh, Asian. Okay. Um, absolutely not. I, I have article after article on this. In Russia itself, no one believes that. There's no records in Mongolia of any there, any domination of, of, of Russia. Um, there were Turkish, very powerful Turkish tribes to the south, the Khazars being one. Okay. Um, that that caused nothing but trouble for, for the Russians. And this is during the Kievan era. Mm-hmm. It would be the high Middle Ages for us, and often serving at the behest of the Jewish or, or Italian bankers, and would would go on slave raids. You know, I think of, you know at their height, you had three million Slavs over that period of time taken from their homes by these by these hordes. Right. This is why smashing the Khazar Empire, smashing these, uh, you know, one tribe after another was absolutely they were they're artificially built up by Western power. But I don't want to get into the Mongol issue because, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's well, no, yeah, Asia. It, it, we're not an issue. Um, yeah, it, it brings up the, the it brings up the Khazar situation because we know that uh, around 840 A.D., uh, who was the uh, the um, Viking king that came down and smashed the, the Khazar kingdom? Uh, do you remember what his name well, was? He, I think it's Ivan. Wasn't, a, wasn't it Ivan? He wasn't a Viking. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, okay. Vi- that, that again, a whole new set of set of. Um, can of worms were opening here. Okay. Um, it was uh, talking about it was Svetoslav was was the first. Um, Oleg was the one who finished it off. Okay. But by then there was almost no, very little Nordic blood in the um, in, in in the elite class at the time. Uh, only a very small number uh, came in. There's, oh, there's questions about the the chronicle, how much we could trust it. Um, but okay. The the the, the Khanate, we call the Khanate of, of um, Khazaria, was, was tremendously powerful, as you well know. Uh-huh. Uh, Oleg was defeated in, in 941, and because he had attacked them, the Khazars shut down the passage to the Volga, to, to the Black Sea. Big problem. Uh-huh. Ah, okay. Now the Byzantines and the Russians were able to find common ground against them. Uh-huh. So uh, and it was a system of extortion, essentially. So it was Oleg's successor, Svatoslav, who died in 972, who took Attil, which is the capital city, and raised it to the ground. But Svatoslav, I mean, Slav is right in his name, so there's no question about his his background. Because um, even some of the some of the so-called Normans or Vikings were Slavic anyway. But, but again, that, that's a whole separate uh, separate issue. Right. But as I say in that article, 
here. And again, we're, we're now we're talking about the middle point of the Middle Ages, I guess you can say, um, you know, not quite to the to the first millennium. That Christendom, East and West, saw Khazaria as Gog and Magog. It right. was almost it was almost universal. And I don't think it really wasn't until the, the, the war in the Crimea where Great Britain created a tremendous uh, propaganda barrage saying, oh, no, that means Russia. And I still, uh-huh. I still think people in the West who believe that today. Yeah, uh, was, most most Judeo Christians uh, believe that. You know, I, I, you know, we, uh, we know that's false. Even the uh, Arabic scholars and the Muslim scholars later considered uh, the Jews, the Khazars, to be Juj Majuj, that is Gog and Magog. Uh, they were they were terrifying. Now they used they had no rules of war. There was no chivalry. They used uh, Turkish nomads as their soul. They always had you know they, they would never trust a local army. So they would always use um, mercenaries who were often paid by how much they could take. <laughs> and, right. you know, there was no rules on, on their behavior and they ruled through terror. Mm-hmm. They were a wealthy place because their money comes from tolls that were charged on the Volga, which was a massive amount of money. That these people. That's how you know, that's where they came from. Uh, slavery, of course, was a big one. Right. Um, and, you know, I mean, Gog and Magog, this is this is an end times thing. And the, the, the smashing of the Khazars and the growth of Russian power south, this is a huge part of the Russian psyche, uh, which is why the, the Russians have never trusted Jews, and um, uh-huh. which is why the Soviets needed to use such violence to impose their uh, their will on people. Right. But yes, you're absolutely right. But this, this is a British, a British a Crimean War propaganda uh, effort, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, now to your article, In Defense of the Khazar Theory, which was published in the Barnes Review, the January-February issue of this year. Um, you are quoting J.D. Barry, I believe. Oh, no, no, no. This is History of the Jews. Solomon Graysell writes, One type of business carried on in the early Middle Ages by the Jews of Europe, namely the slave trade, requires a special word of explanation. The Jews were among the most important slave dealers. As inhabitants of Western Germany pushed their way deeper and deeper into Central Europe, driving the Slavic inhabitants further eastward and taking away their land, they brought back captives whom they sold to Jewish traders. The Jews, in turn, transported these slaves to other lands to be sold to Christian and Mohammedan masters. And then he says, Khazar, or you say, Khazaria minted its own coins by the 830s, um, proving its economic dominance. The Turkic tribes in the Caucasus, such as Merja and Chud, were approached by both Jews and the Russians. So this is uh, just before, 830 is just before their conversion to Judaism. Uh, take us through this area. What, what was going on here? Well, you, you have a powerful empire that comes from a conglomeration of Turkic-type tribes, Mm-hmm. Over a very wide, you know, mountainous area, unity is a big problem. Um, to become Islamic would mean that they would be subject to the caliphate uh, somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Be Roman Catholic is obvious; they're connected to the Pope. To be Orthodox, they'd be under the Byzantine Emperor. Right. So Judaism made a lot of sense for them, especially since slavery was a part of the Talmudic theology. Right. For a slave trading empire, you talk, it's, it's like music to their ears, and. Um, and it just made a lot of sense to them, and it worked, and it took a while. But as you see, you know, if you continue to read, you'll see that you know, so many uh, Arab foreign scholars say that the elite were 100% um, Jewish Talmudic, and and of course this is where our modern Jews uh, come from because this was a huge, uh, very wealthy, very powerful empire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we see uh, and then there, there have been these conflicting theories. Uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the Jews have been promoting the idea that the Ashkenazim are Israelites. We in identity have always disputed that thesis because uh, th- we know that they have Turkish blood, as you, which we uh, trace back to the Hittites, Hittite slash Turkish blood, which uh, the Hittites were the worst enemies of Israel in the old days, in the biblical times. So these people have not one drop of Shemitic blood in them, yet they claim today to be Israel. <laughs> and and it's, it's just a gigantic lie. So... Uh, uh, t- 
tell us how you came to sympathize with the Khazarian slash non-Israelite identification. Uh, oh, well, I mean, this is really it. There's one place where where mainstream scholars will fully admit uh, Jewish bad behavior. Okay, <laughs> and that's in, in, in Khazaria, and then later on in Poland, which is one the same the same group of people. You can't deny it. You can't deny how vicious they were. You can't deny that it was Judaic, and that it was a great thing that because it was purely it, it was it was based on slavery and tolls. They produced nothing. There's no industry there. Mm-hmm. You had sheep farming. You had some agriculture, but everything was based on money. The actual money economy, which is again they they coined their own money. Which at the time was a was a sign of, of sovereignty and 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 control, um, and because they went out of their way to reject any laws of war, they were they were terrifying. And when they came against you, you realized that you know there was going to be no POWs, right? And so you want to hit them, you have to destroy them. You have to hit them and hit them hard. And once they and they were willing to lose money to punish anyone who tried to do so. So when they shut down the Volga, um, finally Byzantium and Moscow came together, uh-huh. and uh, and were able were able to uh, to work on this. Right. But um, there there is no way, given the the radical differences in theology over the centuries, given the radical differences in in just ever the how they think and even how they appear, that the Israelites of the Old Testament have any connection with the Jewish dentist down the street from me. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, right. <laughs> they, they would have to be so bred that would be the case. And there's this explosion of a Jewish population right around this time mm-hmm. uh, in, in Central Europe. Well, there has to be an explanation for that. Yeah. Where they, and, well, and there was a lot of loving was, going on. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah love and tolerance, you mean. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So they just all converted, you know, which is what, you know, the obvious explanation of how the population exploded. Uh, you know, especially since they're semi-agricultural people, even the Edomites back in the Old Testament, they, they were primarily sheep herders and cow grazers and that sort of thing. Uh, not a whole lot of farming, but they were also traders, right? The, the, the Canaanite, uh, Edomite bloodline was par, par, primarily merchant bankers, even in, in the old days of the Bible. And they were very vicious people. Well, you know, they go together. Yeah, <laughs> because I think this kind of buccaneer, you know, that kind of merchant capitalism is just the battlefield, just put in a different different arena. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the same thing, and, I, and they viewed it that way. It was war. Yeah, and whatever they could get away with a with a bad. And when you're dealing with illiterate peasants, you know, they took advantage, and oh, they yeah. got hated real fast. Mm-hmm. You know, they they get kicked out of what 120 city states and, and countries over the centuries, all for the exact same thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. usury, fraud, prostitution, and, brot- but, you know, and brutality. Other- whenever when they can get away with it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you know, um, you had other minorities who actually did very well, like Armenians, who were considered heretics, um, who were never harmed in any way. Mm-hmm. Uh, Arabs, you know, from Syria, who were never harmed in any way, but they were fairly well off minorities throughout throughout uh, Southern Europe. They were never harmed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and remember, when we say the expulsion of the Jews, Karaites were never touched because the Karaites, yeah, those are the uh, non-Jewish never, uh, Samaritans. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, they they rejected the Talmud. Right. And the Tal- Talmud has almost wiped them out. There's very very yeah. few of them, uh, and they have, of course, nothing to say to each other because they're two totally different religions. Yeah. From what I understand, the Karaites are decent, but there's so few of them. Right. Um, uh, you know, the, the even in Spain, the so-called Spanish Inquisition, this is where the uh, Talmud has uh, destroyed the the few Karaites, Karaites that were there. Right. So you've got very few of them left. But that, what I'm saying is when they were – when you said Jew a couple hundred years ago, it meant Talmudist, someone who lives in the Kahal under a rabbi, under the head of the Kahal organization. Mm-hmm. It, wasn't, it wasn't a Karaite. It wasn't a – Samaritan. It wasn't anything like that. It was a very specific Turkish uh, group of people. So okay. we have to be very specific about that. And, and the Karaites were touched in these things. Yeah, and the Ashkenazi are still that exact same group, that mixed group of mongrelized people who practice Talmudic Judaism. That, that hasn't changed at all since uh, 840 AD, right? I, I actually read 
believe it or not, in grad school, I read the Talmud from cover to cover, which was really? a hard, I, I do not recommend it. Oh boy, no. I do not recommend it. Well, I read it very quickly. It's, a lot of it's boring. A lot of it I, I could just go, oh, yeah. go over. But yeah. the stuff that wasn't boring, uh, the obsession with, you know, um, coming up with, with ways to get around the law, mm-hmm. uh, the obsession with sexuality, the obsession with women, you know, young women, yeah. uh, the obsession yeah, with, little with, boys, right? with fecal <laughs> matter. Yeah. Uh, it, it's bizarre. And this is why I said, no, this isn't, I, I, haven't, I don't remember seeing this in, in Leviticus. Right. So who are these people? It, it doesn't take long. If, if you're on, if you're willing to fight and tolerate what's going to be thrown at you, you know, it, it, half the time, these, these Christian Zionists so-called, I, I think they know. It's just, it's yes. just, it, there's so much money and respect in it for them. They have no interest in fighting it. Um, and I think a lot of them are aware. Yes. You know, they know they, they, they sell, you know, Michael Hoffman has done such great work on this, uh, all their magic charms and spells and everything else that they're into. Yeah. They, they, they can't not know this. Yeah. Well, so, they're afraid uh, they would be, you know, yeah. defrocked if they, you know, tell the truth about the Jews. They would. The Jews control Christianity, modern Christianity, They'd totally control it. You know, I've been yeah. fired from the university I've ever taught in. Um, I got my my doctoral degrees because, you know, I'm a nice guy. They they liked me okay. as a person. So when I talked about some of this stuff, they already liked me. So, oh, that's Matt. He's just crazy. <laughs> uh, but he's a nice, than, crazy guy. <laughs> that's exactly. And that's how I got through. Because you don't go on the first day and start Zeke Highland. But, you know, you get to know people. You show that you're a nice guy. They show that you're honest and that you're agreeable. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm still friends with these people. Yeah. My doc, my dissertation advisor was Jewish. Wow. And he knew exactly what, what I was doing. And, yeah, yeah. And, okay. okay well, you're good at what you do, and you're, you're, you're a decent guy. So, you know, I don't agree with you, but... You know, that's yeah. how that's how we got through. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, also th- these Jewish college professors and deans uh, of Harvard and Yale, they they realize that any really controversial material is never going to get mainstream publication. Right. So, yeah. So you know, that Jewish guy could be nice to you and say, uh, yeah, you're doing great work, but he knows that it's not going to be yeah. a bestseller. <laughs> Right, you know, fine. exactly right. Uh, you know, and and then they could get they get to say, see how see how tolerant I am. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. When I got fired right. from St. Mary's. There was one person who defended me, and he was Jewish. Mm. Okay, uh, a professor in the music department. Interesting. And he, you know, I mean, I was really honest with him. He read he read the third room. Uh-huh. Um, but you know, he was a, he was a, he's a really nice guy. He said, look, this guy's a good teacher. Yeah, he's he's Roxy. He has more publications than any of us have. You know, come on. He's not. A, he's not out there in a, in, a, in a brown shirt. Right. You know, his students love yeah. him. What the hell's the matter with you guys? Well, right. well, look what so. they did to Arthur Kessler after he published the Thirteenth Tribe, exposing the fact that the Khazars are not Israelites. Right. I mean, they. I think they murdered him. Yeah, Kessler changed the world. I mean, that yeah. that book was of such significance. I mean, if, unless unless you read Russian, Ukrainian, or Polish, um, uh-huh. that theory right. you wouldn't even know it. But Kessler yeah. brought that out of, of the East and, and made it uh, mainstream. Oh, yeah, they, they wish he was never born. Right, right. Well, Benjamin Friedman also talked about that, uh, but he's much lesser known. Uh, and so uh, he, always, he, he also wrote about the Khazars and the fact that they're not Israelites either. And there's uh, encyclopedias that used to say that, but those articles have been deleted from the encyclopedic de- uh, literature. Okay. But in the old world that we're talking about here, it was common knowledge that uh, Gog Magog were the Jews, the Khazarian Jews. And the Khazars, even before they converted to Judaism, they were known as Gog and Magog. So this is this much is uh, thoroughly established histor- historically. You know, read history books on any, any historical topic prior to 1900. And you know, that's not that long ago. No. And their frame of reference is so radically different from ours. They say things that if we were to say them, or we do say them, you know, we get in all kinds of trouble. That's right. And these were dumbs in major universities. Um, you know, World War II really was the the watershed. But their frame of reference, their knowledge of this stuff, you know, Jews being Khazars, that was day to day. And you would get in yeah. trouble for saying that. Yeah. So, but in World War II, that was the the watershed. And and sometimes we forget just how radically different intellectually the world was. Yes. Understood. In 1900s yes. and, to, yeah. and, and how radical and how fast it was yeah. and how quickly deleted this stuff. 
pre-Zionist and pre-communist history, although not not so much pre-communist because there are a lot of co- communist revolutions locally in Europe in the uh, 18th century. You know, once once they took over Russia, uh, communism became a really big deal. But on page 42 of this uh, January-February issue, you say Benjamin of Tudelia is another traveler who met with the Khazar nobility negotiating trade deals from Iraq. He is emphatic that Khazaria was a Jewish state. Uh, are there any ancient travelers that say otherwise, to your knowledge? Uh, I've never come across it. The, 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 most of, the closest here are people who say, well, it was just the small, uh, the most elite nobility. Okay. But then the problem is that implies that religion was a private matter like it is today. This is not how it worked back no, then. No, no. You didn't, you didn't convert. Was, you didn't. Yeah. No. If if your if your lord converted, you converted, and there was right. nothing oppressive about that. This is how it was. The the, the commune yeah. was far more important than the individual. So that's all anachronistic. We talk. So if the even if the elite on top converted, well, that meant everyone did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know. The, Ultimately, they, Jewish, they did. Yes. Every every burial site there has all kinds of Jewish um, uh, traditions attached to it. There, there, I don't think there's been any that that don't have it. Mm-hmm. So even down to the to the locals, um, they they converted. But that's how you functioned, and and so even if even if they could show that at a certain time it was only a handful of elites, well that's enough mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah. In the next paragraph, you quote Ibn Fadlan, a well-known Arab merchant and traveler in the eighth century, stated that <clears throat> quote the Khazars and their king are all Jews, the Bulgars and their neighbors are subject to him. They treat him with worshipful obedience. Some are of the opinion that Gog and Magog are the Khazars. There we go again. I mean, this just seems to have been the universal judgment that Gog and Magog, Magog and the Khazars are identical. The two, the two big watersheds in our history concerning this stuff <clears throat> is the, the Crimean War, number one. Okay, all right. Where Western Europe essentially went to war with, with Russia over the Middle East, etc., yeah, the British and the French. There was a propaganda barrage, like you wouldn't believe. That's where all the their Asiatic kind of stupid arguments come from. And then, of course, because um, Hitler, you know, later on was was very pro Russian. He says it over and over again in his speeches um, that other than you know the Bolsheviks aren't Russian, and he has very high opinion of them. Um, I don't think the table talks are genuine. So um, uh, in his speeches and 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 what we can know are, are, are true writings. He was, he was very pro-Russian. He wasn't like Himmler. So um, it was, it, you know, when he referred to, he would never refer to Russia as Bolshevik. He would refer to the Soviet Union. And he knew that they were, um, mm-hmm. uh, that they were Jews. So, so the defeat of Hitler meant that the world was divided between liberalism on the one hand and Marxism on the other hand. Right. And all kinds of nationalism were considered uh, defeated and passe and everything else. And that's still the world we live in. That's right. It's gotten worse. Anti-nationalism has gotten worse. Yeah. Yeah, because both Bolshevism and uh, finance capitalism are internationalist thrusts totally controlled by the Jews. So, uh, you know, uh, if, if, very we, similar. Yeah, if we don't uh, f- figure out a way to combat th- this uh, pincer action against the West, we're doomed. Right, because the, the, so few people are capable of having discussion that you and I are having about Jewish influence in both of these spheres. Okay, for example, the college students that have been indoctrinated by their Marxist professors don't realize that they are actually uh, working for the Rothschilds, who in, who have been financing communism for the last couple of centuries. Right? They don't understand that. Well, one of the worst things, you know, when I was in college and grad school, this is all I did. I was obsessed with this stuff. I lived and breathed it, mm-hmm. going over the ancient text, going over the modern text, reading speeches and translating and everything else, obsessed with building arguments and making sure that every I had every T crossed, every I dotted. And then I get out to the real world and realize that truth isn't that important. Yeah. <laughs> truth is an abstraction. Right. People want to hear what they want to hear. People want to hear what's convenient. And, you know, you start talking like I do. I, I've lost so many friends. I don't give a damn anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, you reach a point, you cross the Rubicon, it doesn't make any difference. But there's a, there's a fear. Uh, it, you know, they'll whisper yeah. to you that of course it's you're right. Fear. Yeah. You know, it's absolutely fear. And you know what they'll do 
my, uh, my friend Dan Cleve, my alma mater, University of Nebraska, what they did to him when they found out that he was at Charlottesville. Uh, oh. his, he, his education's finished. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that story from a couple of years ago. I remember um, Charlottesville. I don't remember his story particularly. Maybe yeah. if you want to go into it, go ahead. Well, no, it's just we were briefly because I was in Charlottesville. I went blind for three days because I got oh, sprayed. Oh, I didn't realize that happened to you. Wow. Oh, you didn't know? Oh, yeah. My yeah. son and I were – my son was um, young at the time. He was a medic, and he was – he really, you know, was very, very uh, solid under fire. Ah, uh, okay. We, he was sprayed with bear mace, and, and I had it. Whoa. And, and it's a, it's a gel that attaches to the eye and I went, it was awful mm. and it's not mains. And it took a long, I was blind for, well, it was three days mm. and I had to go to the ER. They, they washed it out. They said, damn this, whoever they really, and they were, they were saturating the air with it. Not a cop yeah. in sight, you know? Anyway, yeah. um, yeah. Uh, you know, in Nebraska is where I got my PhD. I taught there for, for a few years and Dan Cleve was um, a biology student there. They found out somehow that he was, at Charlottesville, there's a picture of him, and the entire campus came down on him. Oh, man. The basketball team was wearing T-shirts, all of them, condemning him. Mm. Before the, on, 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 you know, it was in every newspaper. Yeah. And yeah. the university said, you know, we can't guarantee your safety here. They were. Yeah. <laughs> right. He was over. Being biology, he needs, he needs labs. He has to be there physically. Sure. And I wrote, because it's my alma mater, an alumni. I have a certain right. They wouldn't publish any of my letters. I was been very nice about it. I contacted a bunch of alumni. I said, this is outrageous. I know a few state senators from the area. No one wants to touch it. Right. I said, this guy is all alone. And I wrote him and I said, I, I, I've been where you are. Thank God there was no internet at the time at the University of Hartford. But I know how terrifying this yeah. is. Um, as far as I know, he still hasn't gone back to school. Uh, it's died down now. But this is, and people know this, professors see this. Uh, uh, students see this. This is what happens if you say, and all there was was a picture of him marching there. There's no swastikas yeah, yeah. or anything. Nothing like that there. And this is the entire campus. Uh, you had Jews um, who worked the student newspaper saying, I'm terrified of coming to campus because Dan is here. <laughs> These ridiculous, you know, over-the-top kinds of things. So Right. Yeah. That, that's yeah. the fear. Well, one and white supremacist holding the entire university hostage. Yeah, right, yeah. That's exactly what I said. I said, you guys are got to be kidding me with this. <laughs> now, I can only hope I can only hope that there's a lot of white students there who know and would say, oh, this is disgusting. They can't say anything. Sure. But one day they will. The economy collapses, which has got to happen very soon. I mean, it's in the process anyway. When there's no money to be had for these people, where are they going to go? They're going to know what the truth is. They have nothing to lose now. Yeah. And that's really the only, only hope we have. Yes. But, yeah. but thanks to the internet – People Where are, I mean, what do we do without the internet? What the yeah. heck? We didn't know anything. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, God, yeah. but there are Jews. There's there's Kazaria.org, uh, which is a Jewish site that really says Kazaria is our home. Um, mm -hmm. So they're, 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 you have some of them who are quite honest about it. Yeah, even you Netanyahu know, they, said that. Netanyahu uh, said know, that. Hebrew almost died. Hebrew was was a, almost a dead language. Mm -hmm. Yiddish isn't, a, uh, isn't related to Hebrew. No, <laughs> it's a foreign language. Who are these people, and and how how do these people not be able to figure out that the two languages are unrelated? Yeah, it's German and Slavic. That that's what uh, Yiddish. Yeah, is. yeah, with with a heavy Turkish heavy Turkish influence too. Right. And and um, yeah, they maybe you know these people out there who never heard of the Talmud before, and they claim to be theologians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so on, on the same page, page 42 in the third column, by the 880s, Khazar control over the Dnieper from Kiev, where they collected tribute from the Slavs, began to weaken substantially. Oleg of Novgorod took control from Askold and Deir, and hence laid the foundation of our modern idea of Kievan Rus, Southern raiding of the Rus was even permitted by the Khazars only if they turned over 50% of the take with their Jewish betters. It served both their interests because it permitted the Muslim Arabs and the Rus to fight each other, leaving the Khazars as well-off middlemen now safe from attack. Now, isn't that convenient? They do that the, sa it, the, the same today. Have, Back to you. Exactly. The, the exact same thing. Uh, this can't be a coincidence. Um, it, it shows you the diabolical brilliance here. Oh, man, uh, it is brilliant. And oh, I did brilliant. say that these, these Turkish tribes in the south, you know, so much of, of Russia's 
mentality was to control its borders, especially southern border. Right. I mean, she's surrounded by enemies. And this is why the monarchy just had to develop as a centralized institution, which Kievan Rus never had. And and after the after the um, the Mongol uh, attack um, and and takeover, um, yeah, so we don't get into whether Asiatic or not is, is not the issue. But but they took over, and then once they began to wane, they needed to completely rebuild uh, a new Russian world centralized in Moscow. They simply had no choice. Okay. Because the centralized system in Kievan Rus was not sufficient. Yes. But um, but you know, a, a place like Kazaria had no real unity. You know, the Talmud, there's no there's brotherhood. There's warlords. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no brotherhood in the Talmud. You know, it's there to justify slavery and to maintain their independence. That's really what it came down yeah. to. Yeah. And, and so yeah, they, had a lot of cr- they had a lot of cracks in that system. And you had oh, yeah. two powerful societies, Greek and mm-hmm. Slavic, now had, having enough of them. They pushed too hard, like they always do. And finally, uh, Svetoslav right. destroyed them in, in 968. And they scattered, and mostly to Central Europe. Okay. All right. Now, most of our listeners know the story of how, and you mentioned it briefly earlier, about how the uh, Bulan had to choose among three religions, you know, or Orthodox Christianity, Russian version. Uh, the, yeah, yeah, you mean uh, Yeah. The Islam and Judaism. Okay. Those were the three choices. Where did, and they chose Judaism because to avoid making enemies with either the, of the other two sides. Where does Byzantium fit in here? Well, you get, that's, you're, you're getting the, it, a little bit mixed up. That's um, St. Vladimir, the, the enlightener of, of Russia, had that three religion thing. Um, Bulan was, you know, oh. uh, that's where that story comes. Now, it, it's, it's, a, it's a stylized story. It's not literally true, but it's oh, very true okay. in another Okay, well, please explain, because uh, I'm not sure what you mean that Vladimir had that three three religion game going. Uh, well, in the explain. ancient, in the, yeah, in the in the um, the primary chronicle, it tells a story of you know the pagan world. You know, again, there was no unity there. Uh, it was a decentralized society. Uh-huh. He knew that that these these tribes were going to eat them up alive unless they they joined together. They needed this. They wanted to be part of civilization. Okay. And you had one of the three, either you had Islamic civilization, you had the Khazars, and you had um, uh, two, two different, you know, um, and this was prior to the schism between East and West. So the Greek. Oh, prior to. Oh. Yeah. The schism okay. was until roughly 1100. So, you know, 1054 okay. to 1100. At least um, in that area. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So That's, I see. But still, there was a big difference between the Greeks and, and the Latins, the Romans. Mm-hmm. And. It really came from uh, uh, it came from Bulgaria is where is where the Slavic Orthodox came into to Russia from. Okay. Um, but they were under under the Byzantine uh, suzerainty anyway. Yes. Okay. So it's, it's a stylized story, but the concept is just like the Khazars. You know, you, you and, and actually Saint Vladimir actually was convinced by Orthodoxy because he completely changed his life. He he you know he stopped. Um, uh, his his kind of his harem, he dismissed. He uh, uh, fed the poor from his own table. He had homeless in his in his palace. He really went all out, and he wow. really became really had to fear God. So this was a legitimate conversion. He became a Christian. He became a Christian. <laughs> he was terrified. He didn't want to use capital punishment because he was afraid that this was against the faith. And so the 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 yeah. factor of Constantinople wrote him wrote him and says, well, under certain circumstances, it's okay. The point is, that's how scrupulous he was. Wow. Okay. That's uh, that's very interesting. So, in other words, the uh, Russian Orthodox Church migrated from uh, Byzantium through Bulgaria. And uh, so, yeah. uh, and how did it relate to Rome up in Russia? You know, because uh, Poland was uh, Catholic, Roman Catholic, and in Romania, of course. So there must have been, you know, some tension between the Roman Catholics and the or- Russian Orthodox people. Oh, of course. I mean, this is this was the fault line in, in Europe, uh-huh. Serbia, Croatia, Poland, Russia. Um, these were bitter, bitter rivalry. Um, you know, Poland is such an outlier because even though it was a Catholic society, it had this bizarre social system that led to its total destruction in, in, um, in the 1770s. Uh, but Rome, you know, is not a place. It's the concept of order, mm-hmm. the concept of natural law. Um, a legitimate liberty under law. And, you know, the third Rome 
is the concept of the, of the true faith, true civilization. And if you know the Talmud very well, you know one place that gets just raked over the coals is Rome. They despise the notion of this Gentile uh, mm-hmm. powerful civilization based on this high intellectual achievement and, and high tech military and everything else. They loathed it. They despised it. Right. And they never had. They never built it themselves anywhere. Because Arya would be the closest thing. Uh, and so they envied it. They hated it. Right. And um, so after you know Byzantium fell uh, in 1453, and it was taken over by by Islam, Russia found itself as the only independent Orthodox country in the world. Wow. And so it completely altered their personality. They realized that we have a tremendous responsibility. Right. Rounded by enemies. Against Islam and the Jews. <laughs> and the Jews and Roman Catholics, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, and Roman Catholics. And they Very fought good. each other all over the place. So it, it, the, the Russian psyche developed because of this. Okay, Needing Understood. to create a centralized institution, being surrounded by enemies. Everything is the common good, common good, common good. And that's why the nobility, uh, concerned with their own money, was so distasteful. And, of course, we have the oligarchs uh, starting roughly in 1991 who took over uh, almost all Jewish except for, like, Patan, and I think he's the only one. Okay. All Jewish. And, and so the same thing develops again. The right. same kind of Khazaria. I know, of course, as you know, I've written elsewhere that the Jews in Ukraine actually call themselves New Khazaria. Right. They have their own institution that way. I did a whole broadcast on it. It's, it's, a, it's a long story. But Well, Ukraine was taken over by the Jews uh, during that putsch, what, four or five years ago? You know, it was taken I, away from the Ukrainian people, and the Jews took it over. It was absolutely, it was absolutely disgusting what happened there. Yes, totally um, disgusting. I was going through a divorce at the time, and my, my phone was ringing off the hook, and I wasn't, I wasn't really taking calls, and I, I, so I wasn't in the thick of it like I was supposed to be. Yeah. But these people were just making stuff up. Right, right. Fox well, I'll News never, didn't know. I'll never yeah. forget that video. A really beautiful Slavic-looking woman with uh, light red lipstick saying, "We are Ukrainia." And it was the, the production of that video was so perfect. I said to myself, whoever produced this video had millions of dollars at his disposal. This was not a locally produced video. Sure enough, I find out it was produced by an American Jew. Absolutely. You, Ukraine is so heartbreaking because you know, they have, they're the most educated population on the planet. Mm. More, more advanced degrees per capita than anywhere else. Very high wow. IQ. Wow. It was the... It was not only the agricultural center of, of, of yes. Russia, but the, the, the high-tech center of Russia and the industrial center of Russia turned into now what is, can only be considered a fourth world backwater. Right. The IMF, the IMF uh, compares Ukraine with Ghana and Mali mm-hmm. in terms of its economic uh, yeah. system. It, it functions entirely by, by, by American aid. The, the, the currency is worthless. Right, right. Yeah. And the whole thing came about, because I have paper after paper I wrote on this finally, uh, is that, you know, these guys were deeply in debt. Mm-hmm. And the only way they can get out of this is to make a deal with the West, you know, yeah. uh, finance us to take over and we'll sell you essentially the economy piece by piece. Jeez. Um, before, before, yeah. the, before that attempt rebellion, and it's a shame because I like Yanukovych. He's not, you know, uh-huh. he's no, but he's all right. He sold off the two sides of, of Ukraine, East and West, one to shell the other to Exxon, giving them. <laughs> well, he saw. I mean, they full police powers. Yeah, both owned by the Rothschilds. <laughs> yeah, it was a right. fracking operation. They actually had. I read the contracts in the original. They had the ability to take water because fracking takes so much water. Yeah. Uh, from any place in Ukraine they needed. Jeez. And they had full police powers. In fact, there was no money. Selling off the country, literally selling off the not figuratively, literally selling off the country was the only way that they uh, were able to to um, stay afloat. And even that failed. Yeah. And so, and yet you have the example of Belarus and, and Russia that have succeeded in, in, and reversed all that. Ukraine would have even been better off had it been uh, yeah. properly. And that's the heartbreak here because people really are starving. 
Yeah. Okay, so you summarize again on page 42. As Kiev grew in strength, its leadership attacked the Khanate more than once. Oleg was defeated in 941. Soon after, the Khazars shut down passage through the Volga to the sea. The reason for this are the Byzantines and Rus were finding common ground against the Khazars. They knew all-out war was coming. Even local tribes such as the Pekinegs were slowly being brought into the Byzantine orbit. Okay, so... This was uh, probably the only time, uh, although, yeah, the Byzantines then were defeated by the uh, the, the Turkish Arabs, right? the Turkish Muslims, correct? Not, not at this time. Not at this that time. That was sent for this way. That's 1453. Oh, that was later. Oh, okay. But yeah, they were much later. They were always under attack, though. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I understand under- even there the Jews assisted the Turks in, uh, in overthrowing the Byzantine Empire. Okay. Oh, uh, everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. They, they hand, but Islam is Judaism for Gentiles. Yeah. And it's all function that way. It's yeah, a we call it Jews' lamb. We call it Jews' lamb. <laughs> there's no question right. about it. It's organized yeah. the same way. Yeah, there's no right. question about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so how we have all these Khazarian Ashkenazi Jews in Khazaria, what drove them or attracted them to Poland? How did that work out? Well, we, we hinted at it briefly a little while ago. Um, the, uh, the, the nobility in Poland facing this, this kind of onrush of these Khazars who had money, uh, who had experience, who, who did have experience running a country and, and, and running uh, trade routes and everything else. Um, they didn't. The mm-hmm. Polish nobles were generally illiterate. And, um, you know, in other words, they didn't speak Greek or, Greek or Latin. Uh, they, they weren't really cultured, especially at the mid and lower levels. The Jews were the perfect way to take over the cities so that the monarch can have it. Mm-hmm. And they functioned, you know, on the one hand, the Jews were given oh, immunities okay. people claim. All oh, right. So that's their legitimacy came from there. And at the same time, the noble clans are getting a big chunk uh-huh. of their huge income. And, you know. So it's like the old song how are you going to keep them down on the farm once they've seen Paris? So the Jews brought cosmopolitanism to Poland. And it just kind of overpowered the the nobility of Poland to the extent that it was a nobility. To what extent was it a nobility? You're saying they were pretty poor. Well, no. I mean, the the slots or the CM was the uh, parliament, which is where the oligarchs assembled to pass laws. Um, every once in a while, the monarch, especially if he won a big battle, like Jan Kosmir, people like this, uh, would gain would gain power. That would always threaten. I mean, they they would they would withhold funds mm-hmm. and allow the Turks to to defeat an army if if it meant you know because the, they didn't want the king to have any power. They didn't care. They'd give the whole country over. Yeah, if it meant keep their uh, okay. keep their feet, and this, yeah. this, was, this was the whole issue. Yeah, this was what I found stunning in your book, uh, the Third Rome, that the uh, nobility would conspire against the monarch <laughs> if they didn't like him. What kind of country is that? Well, that was pretty much everywhere. I mean, you know, um, there are two different groups of people. Yeah, the monarchy is 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 about you know the common good, and it's always very religious. And the nobles, as a class, um are about their own personal good. And so it always was this back and forth seesaw battle. And the great victory of the czars, starting from Ivan III onward, was to be able to get enough uh, of an income to build this nobility that was loyal to them and that really were, was willing to fight uh, for the sake of the common good. And for the most part, it worked, mm-hmm. unless you had an interregnum like you had prior to Ivan IV, and he was just a, just a kid. And the right. minute they had, you give them an inch, and oh, yeah. they, would, they would run with it. But when they came under control, they were self-sacrificial, and these guys had a rough life. But in, in Poland, it was a military nobility. But the Jews solved the problem. That, you know, how do we keep the king from having any real income? We have bringing in a very powerful, wealthy group of people who depend on us. Because, you know, everyone hated them. Mm-hmm. So being protected by us is really important. So they depended on, depended on us. We're dependent on them. We become wealthy beyond you know, the rich ones became wealthy because for, for take, taxing these guys. Right. They up the churches. They had a full um, uh, monopoly on alcohol, which of course was a big thing with them. Right. And they were, they were the tax farmers, and they collected the tax. The tax farm is a private organization, the Kahal, that would you know, they're given a certain quota amount that they have to raise, 
any penny above that they get to keep. So that means they have every incentive to lie, to steal, to do whatever they can to take yeah. more than what, so, what they're supposed to. That's how they got paid. Right, right. Okay, so did they make this arra- arrangement with the monarch also, uh, or is it primarily with the local lords? No, this is strictly a, a local matter. Okay. Uh, monarchs never trusted them. Monarchs were aware of it. Okay. But, um, in, the, in the you know, starting in the high Middle Ages when this first happened, that the money was flowing in. You know, the, the Jews had this international organization. Yes. They kept all this money. That means that they could charge much lower rates than everybody else. Right. They always had this advantage. They spoke a language no one else did. They they had the tremendous solidarity from one city. I mean, you had you had Antwerp. Uh, you had after the fall of Constantinople, you had Byzantium. Um, Krakow was was the main center in in Poland, and uh, for a while you had you had Spain, and then of course London. Mm-hmm. You know, after the William of Orange came in, so you had wow. this huge network with a huge amount of money that they kept mm-hmm. to themselves. And when you made a deal with them, you knew you were going to get a far far lower rate of interest than you'd get anywhere else. Right, and that's how that's how they brought you in. Yeah, and. This is how they did it. I mean, they they offered something, but the way they dealt with the peasantry is really where they they failed completely. Mm-hmm. And that's what they. Um, I have an article. Uh, it's kind of a separate issue. A long time ago, I, I it's published on my website. Oh, by the way, I should mention this. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, Rush Journal, RushJournal dot org, Rush Journal, R U S dot org, and it has everything of mine. All my articles. The radio show will send you to Radio Area, where I where I um, broadcast from. Okay. All my Radio books are there. Area. Okay. Yeah, Radio Arian is is uh, Sven Longshanks. I he's my producer. He's a he's a close friend of mine. Ah, okay. Uh, and yeah, he's one of the good ones. I I, I trust him. Yeah. Uh, so I want to you know, and um, there's a donation button on there because you know being independent uh, costs. <laughs> I, don't yeah. a, I don't have a I don't have a I don't have a university. I don't have a think tank. It's all my friends. That's how right. I function. All right, so it seems like uh, Poland was really the first, how should I put this, a debt slave nation created by the Jews. And uh, this debt slave nation slowly migrated its way west, although we do have Spain. Spain was a little bit different because those were Sephardic Jews. Those were Sephardic Jews in league with the Berber Muslims. Okay, that uh, across the uh, not the Channel, the the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, right. and they conspired against the Visigoths, the Visigoths of Spain, and uh, overthrew the Visigoths. Now those were Sephardic Jews, but they're not Israelites either. <laughs> they also yeah, stem. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. That distinction, I used to make a big deal out of that distinction. I really don't anymore. Okay. I mean, they could be rivals, but, oh, yeah. you know, they're Good. with respect. Rabbis are treated with respect in Israel and everything else, you know. So that distinction is not that big of a deal. It can matter, but they're on the same side. Right, right. Well, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bernstein, I think his name. He wrote the book, uh, uh, My Life in Racist Marxist Israel. Yeah. He he was a Sephardic Jew, and he says he was very much discriminated against by the Ashkenazim. That the Ashkenazim were really the the power brokers, and Sephardics didn't count. Uh, probably by this time, this was in the 1960s. All right, probably by this time, there is no difference anymore. The Ashkenazim pr- have pretty much overwhelmed the Sephardics by this time. So I would agree, there probably isn't much difference anymore. Yeah, the chief rabbi of Israel was was Sephardic. Uh, okay. Sometimes, you know, it's not, you know, yeah, of course, it's going to be rivalry, but the, you know, the, the the way that the kahal functioned, you know, you had this elite group of rabbis who kept all the money, and you didn't have poor families under them. Mm-hmm. How did they keep them loyal? And E. Michael Jones mentions this. I've been talking about this for years. The depiction, I mean, they're completely closed society. The depiction of Gentiles as animals. Mm-hmm. Ravenous psychopaths that would kill us for no reason, just because they hate us for no reason, and and this is how they they maintain this loyalty. They don't speak the local language. There's no way for them to get any outside information. Um, the so-called enlightenment broke the power of the kahal for a while. Yeah, for a while, but, yeah. You know, but that is it, that's a separate issue. But 
the, the Cajal system is how they ruled. And this is what maintained the loyalty of poor Jews. Right. And this is where the so-called solidarity comes from, years and generation after generation of saying that if you leave us, if you go to them, um, uh, they're going to kill you. We'll disown you on top of it, <laughs> right? Of course, there are a lot of poor Jews in, in Poland and in Russia as well, uh, but they weren't really that horribly badly off because they always could go to their local rich Jew friend, you know, and get a handout. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, they were poor, but, but yeah, they, they, they were all part of the community. Right. And, you know, and they, they needed, yeah, they, they needed the occasional anti-Jewish riot to keep right. people <laughs> There you go. So they needed, the, they needed the Unterjuden to be sacrificial lambs that they could say, oh, we poor Jews, we're so persecuted. And sometimes yeah. they would stage those riots themselves. The Oberjuden would sacrifice the Unterjuden on many occasions. Now, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time on um, debunking the myth of the, of the pogroms in Russia. Right, late, uh, right, right. I think it's early 20th century. Um, overwhelmingly, you know, people forget that these Jews were heavily armed. There were no gun laws in Russia at the time. Uh-huh. Uh, these, these Jewish centers, you know, the Jakobinsky organization and everything else, these, these, these had, they had heavy weapons. Right. The Odessa, for example, the Jewish capital of Ukraine, Russian Empire at the time. Right. Uh, the mayor was was not only a Jew but a communist mm -hmm. for a long time. They okay. had they had weaponry. They usually fought. They they usually fired first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, it's the same procedure. You know, they, they need yeah. this kind of stuff. They need violence, just like Israel needs violence to maintain the spigot to the to Washington D.C. Right. Okay, in about 10 minutes, I'm expecting uh, Daryl from Missouri to call in. If he doesn't, are you able to you know, carry on for the balance of the show? You know, What's uh, the balance of the show? Yeah, we're, we're approaching the 90-minute mark, and uh, but we're live for two oh. hours, okay? No, I'll, 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 I'll keep it at 90 minutes, if, if you don't mind. Oh, okay, all right. So the only thing I want to do is just to, to let your listeners know that, you know, to go on my site, if, if you have... You know, if, if you like what I'm saying, support what I'm saying, mm -hmm. uh, please, please help help out. You know, okay. my, my, my divorce almost killed me. Right. I'm not kidding. Yeah, yeah. And, so and so give, just, us a, give us your contact was, information yeah. again before yeah. before you leave, okay? The various – and the various websites that you're affiliated with. And well, I mentioned Rus Journal. That's, that's, that's the main one for me. Rus Journal, okay. Yeah, rusjournal.org. Dot .org. Um, and that was set up by by Matt Parrott a long time ago. These are the guys that kind of brought me out of my out of my doldrums. Okay. Around 2014. Uh, that's that's the first thing. The second, of course, is Radio Aryan. Um, okay. We're we're not competitors in any way with Eurofolk. We're allies and we're friends. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's how it's always going to be. I, I never. I don't think anyone thinks that. I just want to let me know. Right. That's yeah, no. how we view. No, yeah, I mean, gonna, we're, we're all going to be in the same gulag. Yeah. 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 Okay. But, you know, my definition my definition of a friend and a brother is someone who has a very good chance of sharing a gulag cell with me. Right. <laughs> Too good That's a my chance. Definition. Too good That's a my chance. Definition. Right. Right. And okay. if you fall into that category, then you are a brother of mine. So yeah. um, my Skype is St. Sava. That is S T underscore S A V A. That's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Okay. And um, this is all I do. I'm full time. I've been doing this now, you know, almost 30 years writing, translating, um, constant study, broadcasting, interviews, travel, uh, everything else. You know, I do nothing else. I'm incapable. I'm good at two things. I'm good at number one, historical analysis, and number two, making very attractive babies. Yeah, okay, and making I, enemies I, of the Jews. <laughs> I'm sure that. Well, my kids, my kids, my kids are. You know, they're they're in college. They're they're on our side, thank God. And good. and, and they, yeah. let me tell you a quick story. When they came back, they had, they, had, they had to go to the Holocaust Museum. Oh. In, from school, I didn't say a word. I was not going to okay. bias. This was a long time ago. They were just, they were little. My son uh, came home and said, "Damn, I hate these people." <laughs> Outstanding. And I, I said I said I said Gabriel, what do you mean? He said, "All they did was attack Christians." Right. Of course, you know, all they did it was so controlled. You know, it's it's like a, you yeah. start from the top and you go down. Everything well, it's like a museum. Christianity for the hoax. Yeah, exactly. And he said it was so basically my both my kids, okay. both had, and they both came back saying it was so over the top. 
they so overstated their case. It was just overwhelming. Same things over and over again. Right. And they were making fun of them on the bus. On ah, the way home. Ah, very good. Very good. And I have the feeling that that's not just them. Uh, I think that's very, very common. Yeah. And I thank yeah, God I moved my family to a very conservative area. Yeah. Uh, in, in central Pennsylvania. We, we don't have to worry about, about much. But that's exactly what happened. They're, they overplayed their hand. 